that that body be moved count as a true cause of the conditional fact with which it is necessarily connected as God's willing that L1 is a true cause of the other conditional fact with which it is necessarily connected. Malbranche will certainly say no, but on what rationale? His apparent definition of true cause uh, in the recherche provides, uh, so far as I can see, uh, no, does not provide the needed rationale. Nor is that all. I assume that Malbranche would want to say that if that body is moved on the occasion of this angel's willing that it be moved, God, or more precisely, one of God's volitions, is the true cause of the body's movement. His assumptions do entitle him to say that if he supposes that God wills the body's movement by a particular volition. But I think that is not his view. And if the only divine volition responsible for the body's movement on the occasion in question is God's general volition that L1, that leaves Malbranche without a divine volition from which that body's movement necessarily follows. For no movement of the body follows necessarily from L1 unless this angel wills that, that, that the body move, which is presumably a contingent rather than a necessary matter. My conclusion from this set of reasonings is that Malbranche's occasionalist theory needs a fuller and more complex definition or conception of true cause. Well, a fuller and more complex conception of true or real causality is ascribed to Malbranche by Steve Nadler. It involves not only necessary connection, but also power. Nadler says the necessity of the connection has to be grounded in a real power or nature in the agent. This invocation of the idea of power seems to me to be on the right interpretive track. In a passage quoted by Nadler, Malbranche refers to the idea that one has of cause or of power to act as a single idea, which seems to imply that cause and power to act are roughly equivalent. That's oversimple, I think, but it's not out of character for Malbranche is not careful to distinguish the roles of God and God's volitions in causation. The relevant power is to be sought, no doubt, in the agent, as Nadler puts it. According to Malbranche, of course, the agent is God. But it is not from God, the existing being or subject of action, or merely from God's possession of power, but rather from God's acts, specifically from God's volitions, that the effects in the created world necessarily follow. As I pointed out earlier, Malbranche does not suppose that anything in the created world follows necessarily just from God or from God's essence or existence or possession of a faculty. Stated more fully then, the interpretation of Malbranche toward which Nadler points us is that true causation implies an effect that follows from an act or state of an agent with a necessity that is grounded in a real power of the agent. Which then is the true cause, the act or state, or the agent? The different relations in which those two stand to the effect are both naturally called causal, but they are different. What is most important for clarity here is not to decide between them, but to see that being necessarily sufficient for the occurrence of an effect and being the subject that has the power by which the effect is produced are different relations to the effect and do not necessarily, nor perhaps even typically, belong to the same item. Uh, that is to say, the item that has one of them perhaps typically belongs to the item that has the other, or something like that. In one possible precisification of Malebranche's views, we might perhaps speak of God's acts, specifically God's volitions, as true efficient causes of created effects, and of God as the true agent cause of created effects. A next point is that we should note here, a next point about the, the concepts that are involved here, is we should note here that there's no implication in Malbranche, as there will later be quite emphatically in Kant's say, that causation as such essentially involves universal laws. The explanatory force of occasional causes does depend 
on the law-like conditional form of God's general volitions. But the obtaining of the laws itself needs explanation, and the ultimate explanation is sought in God's power, whose true causal efficacy is not conceived as always involving universal laws. For example, it doesn't involve true universal laws when God does miracles, which Malbrash insists God occasionally, though as rarely as possible, does. I'm going to skip over uh, the next section, which is a, just an illustrative uh, value, and go on to section two, free will. Malbranche's treatment of free will is of interest here because, in the first place, it employs broadly ca causal concepts quite different from his conceptions of real and occasional causes, and in the second place, it seems to be in tension with his occasionalist doctrine. In the very first chapter of the Recherche, Malbranche says that our will is active, agissant, and that it ha has in itself the power, force in French, French, to determine in different ways the inclination or impression that God has given it. Whereas matter is entirely without action, it has no power to arrest its motion and to determine it or to turn it to one side rather than another. Is our will then a true cause? Well, let's examine that. First of all, what is the will, the human will, that is active, according to this statement? Malbranche's first explanation of the meaning of will, and all, what I've just quoted and what I'm about to quote are all from the very first chapter of uh, The Search After Truth. Uh, Malbranche's first explanation of the meaning of will, volonté, uh, is that it's the faculty by which the soul is capable of receiving several inclinations. But he has in the same chapter a second explanation or definition. By the word will, volonté, Malbranche says, he means to signify the impression or natural motion that carries us toward the good in general, which he characterizes as indeterminate good and identifies with God. Is this, a defini this second ex definition a definition of volonté as volition, as distinct from faculty? I wouldn't put it that way. I would render volonté as volition in some context in Malbranche's work, for instance, where effects are said to follow necessarily from God's volonté. But in those contexts, volonté clearly signifies something more determinate than in either of the explanations of the term that are offered in the first chapter of the Recherche. The will as impression or natural motion does, however, seem to be something more determinate than the will as faculty. And I take Malbranche uh, in this context, the will as impression or natural motion, to be speaking of what I might call a tendency toward what is good as such, and speaking thus of a sort of teleology and final causation, uh, among other things. I'm going to pass over the, the next paragraph. Uh, the time is short. How about freedom, liberté? Mal Malbranche uh, defines uh, liberté, freedom, as a power to affect the direction of the God-given impression that carries us toward the good in general. Specifically, it is the power that the mind has to turn the impression, toward, that impression, toward the objects that please us, and thus to make our inclinations terminate in some particular object. Uh, that requires explanation, obviously. Uh, Malbranche conceives of our freedom as a power that God enables us to exercise only within a narrowly limited, incremental context that is caused by God. Malbranche is particularly interested in what happens in our minds when we sin. Malbranche explains this particularly fully uh, in the first of the elucidations that he added to the search after truth, and which that first elucidation is all about freedom of the will, freedom of the human will. He says, God pushes us ceaselessly and by an invincible impression toward the good in general. 
invincible, we can't decide not to have that general in, that, uh, impression. This is that impression or natural motion that carries us toward the good in general or indeterminate good, which defines our will in some sense for Malbranche. We do not have the pow a power to cease having that tendency because God's pressure is ceaseless and invincible. We don't have the power not to have it. However, as we'll see, uh, Malbranche thinks we do have a power, uh, we do have a power to determine in some ways uh, what form that tendency takes. So another thing God causes in us is he, that God causes us to perceive an idea or have a sensation of some particular good, some thing, experienced object that is good. God moves us toward this particular good. Once again, I think the most plausible interpretation is that what God thus causes in us is a tendency. And Marlborough says, that's all that God does or makes fit in us when we sin. What the sinner does freely is that the sinner rests, as Malbranche puts it metaphorically, in the particular good instead of going on to other goods and ultimately to God in following the natural impression or tendency toward the good in general. That's the sin. That resting is the sin. This is a very Augustinian conception of sin. God does not cause the sin. For, as Malbron says, God does not move us necessarily or invincibly toward the love of this particular good. Our freedom lies in having, at the same time, the power to rest in the particular good and the power not to rest in it, but to move beyond it following the impulse toward larger good. The mention of love here is significant. In his main discussions of free will, Malbranche thinks of the will as choosing freely among loves and not directly among external actions. He also holds that it is on the basis of their loves that God judges soul. This again is very Augustinian. I'm gonna change the order of the paragraphs here just a little bit. Our free choice, as uh, just described, uh, in this matter, is not a true cause, but only an occasional cause, according to Malbranche, of any occurrences, any occurrence in bodies, or even of any further occurrence in our own minds. We can effectively choose to think about larger good.